All right, what's up, Ninja Nerds? How you guys doing? Hope all of you guys are doing well. We're gonna go ahead and get started on our case study today. All right, we are covering case study number 16. Patient presents with diarrhea, <laughs> all right? So let's go ahead and talk. Medical disclaimer, you guys obviously know that this is fictitious, it's not real, we're making these things up. It's designed to help us to like have a systematic approach to learn a little bit more about the disease and the clinical side of things. So let's go ahead and start talking about this patient. All right, so with this patient, we, um, we have a 40 year old male, no significant past medical history, uh, come to the ED with watery diarrhea for the past couple days, two days, Patient states she's had an average of about three plus episodes of diarrhea um, per day and admits to a foul odor of that stool. Complains of cramping abdominal pain along with associated like nausea, vomiting. Uh, denies any kind of blood or any signs of bloody diarrhea or mucusy kind of diarrhea. She has no sick contacts that she can, uh, he has no sick contacts that he can attribute to, no recent travel, and does, uh, does actually admit that he was just treated for some MRSA cellulitis um, with clindamycin. All right. So vitals on this patient. We have heart rate 130, so they're a little tacky. Respiratory rate 20, that's fine. BP's a little soft, 90 over 65. Okay, so a little bit soft. Temp 101.6, so they're febrile. Uh, fee, uh, the SpO2, their oxygen saturation, 96% uh, on room air. Okay, so tacky, little blood, soft blood pressures, fever. Cardiovascular, we obviously know that when we're listening to the heart, we're hearing some tacky cardia, right? Regular rhythm, normal S1, S2, clear to auscultation bilaterally, you know, wheezing, rails, ronchi. But when we palpate that abdomen, it's a little distended. We notice it's a little distended, it's a little firm, and it's tender to palpate over all four quadrants and they have some decreased bowel sounds. Okay? What's your thoughts? So what are you guys thinking? We've got a patient, 40 year old male, really just a recent treatment of uh, MRSA cellulitis with uh, Clinda, some abdominal pain, some nausea, some uh, uh, vomiting, and no bloody stools, their watery diarrhea for the past two days, it's three plus episodes, foul odor, um, tacky, slightly uh, hypotensive febrile, and uh, ab abnormal abdominal findings on their exam. What are you guys thinking? <laughs> this is a pretty easy one, right? I feel like this is a pretty straightforward kind of uh, diagnosis. It's one of those classic kind of vignettes. A lot of you guys are saying C. diff, C. diff, C. diff, um, C. diff sepsis, pancreatitis, Yeah, I like it. Someone said uh, cholera. Yeah, it's not a bad one, especially with the watery diarrhea. They didn't have any like recent travel or anything like that, but that still doesn't rule them out. Okay, cool. A lot of you guys are saying C diff, which I think is definitely a good idea. All right, labs. What do you guys think about these? CBC. What would that tell me? CMP. What would that tell me? Lactate. Why am I getting a lactate? ABG. What's the reason for that? And do I need a stool analysis? So if I got a CBC, what would a really a CBC maybe tip off for me? Why am I getting a CBC for this patient who has uh, fevers, who's a little soft in the blood pressure range, a little tacky, some diarrhea? What, what would a CBC really tell me? Uh, is it gonna give me any kind of information um, that is helpful in this diagnosis? Uh, what we a lot of people are saying is maybe C. diff. Some people are saying cholera. Some people are saying um, some pancreatitis. Someone asked if he drinks alcohol. No, no drinking of alcohol. Yeah, so it's a really simple question, right? So CBC is gonna tell you a little bit about their white count. Do they have any leukocytosis? So this is actually a really interesting thing. Um, I had a patient once who didn't have any diarrhea. Um, got a CBC on them and then their white count was like 40,000. And I was like, what the heck? They didn't have anything on their chest x-ray, their CT scan um, of the chest. Um, UA was normal. I looked throughout their skin. I didn't see any kind of abnormal skin findings. I couldn't really find a, a septic focus. I even sent them to get a CT scan of the abdomen, contrast, study to see if there was anything there. And the bowels just looked a little bit like dilated. Um, but there was nothing like, there was no like colitis real findings. 
And sometimes in a patient who has like this un, unexplained leukocytosis that's astronomical, have a high, have like a low threshold for suspecting potentially a C diff, even if they don't have diarrhea. This patient didn't have any diarrhea. And so it was kind of odd for me to think to treat C. diff, but it's still something to think about. If you have an astronomically high white blood cell count and you can't find a reason why they have that white count and you haven't been able to find like an infectious or septic focus, have a, have a thought about potentially C. diff, even if they don't have diarrhea. Okay, that's a big one. Uh, the other thing a CBC may tell me is... Um, uh, whenever they have uh, C. diff, they're having a lot of diarrhea, so they're losing a lot of volume. That volume can kind of concentrate their blood and make their hemoglobin and their um, um, hematocrit look like they have polycythemia, but it's really just hemoconcentration. So sometimes they may have like a little bit of a volume down kind of appearance because of the excessive diarrhea. So also look for any kind of signs of hemoconcentration as well. So kind of like a high appearing hemoglobin and a high appearing kind of hematocrit, it looks like they're actually polycythemic, but it's just their volume down. Okay. All right, cool. CMP. Obviously, a CMP is going to tell me a lot of things. Whenever anybody complains of abdominal pain, they have diarrhea, you should always get a CMP. It tells you everything you kind of need to know about the liver. So is there any elevated LFTs, any elevated AST, ALT, ALKFOS, bilirubin, all those good things. Tell me about their albumin levels. Those are all good things to order, okay? It also gives me some an identification of their kidney function. So do I know what their BUN, their creatinine looks like? Is their creatinine elevated? Sometimes they have an elevation of their creatinine because they're pooping out a storm and they're just losing volumes of fluid from their poopies. And so it's lowering their actual blood volume and they're not perfusing their kidneys as well. And they get like a pre-renal AKI. So that could be another thing as well. And then also if you're just pooping out everything that you're eating, you're also going to have some pretty significant types of uh, electrolyte derangements, maybe hypokalemia, right? Uh, maybe some hypocalcemia, things of that nature as well. So, yeah. And then an ABG, uh, lactate is obviously really good because if you have... A person who is maybe uh, a C. diff and the, the, the bacteria is seeding into the bloodstream, you have a significant amount of colitis or they have a toxic megacolon or they're perfing or anything like that, that puts them at high risk of like a hypovolemic kind of shocky state. And that can really kind of drive up their lactate levels. Also, if you're destroying the bowel wall, that destruction of the bowel wall, that tissue destruction is going to release out a lot of lactate as well. So that's another reason. So I check lactate, make sure that there's not any kind of like uh, obvious signs of like tissue destruction, necrosis, or any kind of like hypoperfusion kind of state. And then you can also get an ABG. ABG is good for get to determining if they have any acidosis. Um, and then obviously a stool analysis. Do I want to go this route? Well, let's see what these labs give us first. Let's see if there's anything that kind of pops out. Okay. So I just want to look at what you guys said, possible met metabolic acidosis, looking for an elevated lactate. All that bicarb's going down the drain, literally. Yeah, good. Yeah, Margaret is, is pretty much hitting that. So they could have not just a lactic acidosis, but they could have what's called a um, a non-anion gut metabolic acidosis from severe diarrhea as well, because they're going to be pooping out their bicarb. Okay. Da, 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 da. Electrolytes, okay. Good, 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 good. All right, cool. I like it. You guys are on point. Okay, so here's what we got from their uh, labs, just particularly those non-specific ones. We didn't do any stool analysis just yet. So we got a CBC, they got 40K, woo, with the left shift. So there's like a bandemia present. Creatinine is 1.9, their baseline is 0.9 to 1.1. What does that mean? If I have a creatinine of 1.9 and their baseline is 0.9 to 1.1, what do you guys consider that? Okay, while well, you guys are going through that, tell me what you guys think. Um, lactate six, normal, like you want it less than two. So I got their lactate bump. ABG, 7.2, so acidotic. Um, O2, 80. Bicarb, oh sorry, CO2, 28. And then the bicarb is 14. So they got a drop in their bicarb, which is 14. Their CO2 is a little drop, not too crazy. It's like 35 to 45 is normal. It's down 28. O2 is in the normal range. And Alexandra hit that perfectly. Yep, AKI. And we can define an AKI, AKI by an increase in creatinine by at least greater than or equal to 0.3 milligrams per DL, right? Uh, particularly when um, within like a 48 hour period. And so this is definitely greater than or equal to 0.3 milligrams per DL. You can also go by 1.5, so greater than or equal to 1.5 times their baseline. That's also another way that we could determine that. So it looks like they have a little AKI, could be pre renal. Um, so lactate, they have a lactate bump, so they have a hyperlactatemia. 
Um, and then ABG shows an acidosis. Acidosis, we have a pH going down, the CO2 is going down, and the bicarb is going down. Remember, we always know that whenever the bicarb and the pH are going in the same directions, it's a metabolic acidosis. What's the cause of the metabolic acidosis? If I told you that their anion gap was greater than 12, we would know that it's an anion gap metabolic acidosis. And then if I told you their lactate was elevated, we would know that it's a lactic acidosis, which is their cause of an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. Cool. And we had a little bit of compensation with their breathing a little bit faster, slightly faster to breathe off their CO2. That's why their CO2 is just below the level of baseline. Okay, cool. So we have a patient that looks kind of sick on their labs. Pretty sick, right? So yeah, left shift, meaning that you're kind of having a, um, so whenever you have a leukocytosis, right, you obviously have an increase in their white count, but your bone marrow is just working really, really hard to start pushing out tons and tons of white blood cells. And so you kind of get this shift into making lots of like, these little, it's called band cells. And so these band cells are kind of like immature white blood cells. And so that can indicate kind of a left shift, uh, meaning that there's a lot of what's called bandemia, kind of an immature white blood cells due to the increased requirement of white blood cells and by the red bone marrow because of you needing these this intense leukocytosis type of reaction. All righty. So you guys good with all that? Definitely we got a patient here who's looking not too good, I would say. Um, let me see here really quickly. I want to see if there's any other questions or things here. Da, 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 da. Real dysfunction, AKI. Yep, you guys are all saying AKI. And again, it could be a pre-renal. could be an intra-renal. Um, we don't really know, right? Well, I have a feeling it's pre-renal because they're hypovolemic, probably from the pooping their brains out, right? They're just, they got the Hershey squirts. So they're just draining volume from their body and that's potentially putting them into a hypovolemic state, not perfusing their kidneys. But you gotta be careful because if you have someone in a hypovolemic state for a decent period of time, it can precipitate an acute tubular necrosis. Usually that's more common in sepsis, but we don't know, this person may be septic as well. All right, either way, uh, definitely looks like they have a leukocytosis with a left shift. They have a AKI. They have a lactic acidosis. Now, my question for you is, for anybody who comes in with diarrhea, do we just automatically just say, oh, let's send a stool analysis. Let's rule out all these different types of infectious causes. Do we just do that right away? Well, it's important to have a clinical context, right? We want to know were they on anti antibiotics. Because a lot of you guys are like automatically saying, oh, C. diff, C. diff, C. diff, C. diff. It definitely is possible for it to be C. diff, right? So if that is the case and we have uh, in their history that they did take particular medications, antibiotics, that is obviously important. But we want to know, do they have any chronic conditions which predisposes them to having chronic diarrhea? Do they have inflammatory bowel disease? Do they have IBS? Do they have celiac disease? Um, something of that nature. Um, so I want to know, is there a particular chronic understanding of their diarrhea? Because if they have chronic diarrhea, I might have a lower threshold to say, okay, let's go ahead and test them. It could be like if they have IBD, maybe they're having a relapse of their underlying ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, and that's the reason for their diarrhea. Uh, but sometimes it can be difficult to kind of mash out. This could be infectious diarrhea. There could be E. coli. It could be salmonella. It could be a bunch of different things. But a stool analysis, I'd say, is reasonable in this person because they have a history of antibiotics. Now, my question for you guys is not all antibiotics have a high association with C. diff associated diarrhea. Which are the antibiotics that you guys can think of that there was a there was actually a kind of like a study where they looked at what's called the odds ratio, um, particularly of those particular antibiotics that had a high odds ratio of causing C. diff associated diarrhea. Which type of antibiotics do you guys know that has a high odds ratio of causing it? What are you guys thinking? A couple of antibiotics. I just want to know, like, if you guys can tell me a couple of them that are pretty, pretty significant. I want you guys to hit those on the head. Okay, Clinda. Clinda's a big one. Quinolones. Fluoroquinolones is a big one. A couple more. Ciprofloxacin is a uh, fluoroquinolone. Good. What else? Looking for a couple more. Amoxicillin, not so much. Fluoroquinolones, definitely. Clindamycin, definitely. There's another one. A couple more, actually. It's actually surprising when you think about it because um, we prescribe it a lot of the time. Oh, there you go. 
So someone said R Rosefin, so triaxone. So really any kind of third generation cephalosporin actually has one of the highest odds ratio. So any third generation cephalosporin has a very high odds ratio. I think it was like 3.2 of causing um, C. diff associated diarrhea. So third generation cephalosporins like Rosefin or ceftriaxone is a big one to think about. And then someone hit the another one, meropenem. Any kind of carbapenem also has a high odds ratio of causing uh, particularly C. diff associated diarrhea. So you got fluoroquinolones, you guys hit that. Clindamycin, you guys hit that. Third generation cephalosporins, you guys got that one. Carbapenems, there's one more. One more. I'll give you a hint. We prescribe this for UTIs, um, particularly like cystitis related. We, provide, pre we prescribe this for MRSA cellulitis. You can even give it for community acquired kind of MRSA infections. Oh, there you go. Ryan Julio said it. Trimethoprim sulfa, which is also known as Bactrim. Okay, cool. So you guys got that. So I want you guys to remember though. So if you ever have a patient who's on any kind of fluoroquinolone, they're on Bactrim, they're on Clinda, they're on a third generation cephalosporin, or they're on um, uh, a carbapenem of any kind, and they start developing some intense diarrhea, have that in the back of your mind. Those are definitely associated with a high risk of C. diff associated diarrhea, okay? Cool deal. All right, so I think that they definitely have one of those antibiotics that puts them at risk, okay? So my question is, when do I actually consider testing for C. diff? The reason why is that sometimes I feel like sometimes we can easily jump the gun and start testing people for C. diff associated diarrhea without actually looking into their clinical history and things like that. So we wanna know, if I have a patient that is on a good bowel regimen, or they have some type of underlying chronic disease uh, that they have diarrhea at baseline and they have just like a little bit of an increase in that. I need to make sure that I rule it out. You know, are they on any kind of intense bowel regimen? Is this related to their underlying chronic cause? Those are things to think about. But the things that makes me a little concerned and immediately testing for C. diff is any kind of sign of um, a significantly elevated white blood cell count without an obvious source. I already told you guys that one. If I see a super high white count without an obvious source of infection, that's a concern for me. If I have to hospitalize the patient, if I have to admit them, this patient definitely should be admitted for observation. If they're being admitted into the hospital because of their underlying diarrhea, and you've ruled out that it's not a chronic cause, it's not due to medications or bowel regimen kind of things, that's an indication for C. diff treatment. Um, I'd say if they have any kind of risk factors, really. So if they have any kind of underlying chronic kidney disease, liver disease, inflammatory bowel disease, that's another indication. And I would also say if you get, if we get any imaging and their imaging has any, any concern for colitis, um, ileus kind of appearance, um, or toxic megacolon, that is an immediate type of uh, uh, trigger to test for C. diff associated diarrhea, okay? So I would say, is there definitely antibiotic relationship here? Yes. Do they have some of the concerning signs? They have a kind of a hemodynamic instability, an instable state. I would say that they are a little soft in the pressure. They're a little tachycardic. They have an insane leukocytosis. They have an acute kidney injury. They got a lactic acidosis. Uh, and they got intense diarrhea with history of antibiotic that is definitely correlated with it. And I definitely would admit this person for diarrhea. So I definitely think that they fit the bill to be tested for C. diff associated diarrhea, right? Okay, so my question for you guys is, what is the first test that I would do? So there's all these different tests that you can go with for C. diff. What's the first test that I would actually try first to see, I'd send off this stool test, and if it came back positive, it's kind of a good screening test Gives me a little bit of idea if they could have C. diff. Those fancy commode liners come in real handy, let me tell you. <laughs> um, so again, what kind of test would I start off with? If I have to start off with any kind of stool test, what would be kind of like the, it's a good screening test. It's it's. It's not specific, it's not super specific, it's slightly sensitive for C. diff. Um, it's kind of a good start off test. I'm looking for a very specific type of enzyme um, that could be released from the C. diff bacteria that you can pick up with an enzyme amino assay. It is a very specific type of hydrogenase enzyme. 
I'm looking for a what? Come on, come on, ninja nerds. What is the specific type of antigen that I'm testing for in the stool that may be a little bit more specific for uh, C diff? It's not specific, it's sensitive for C diff, not specific. Yes, Ryan Julio said it, GDH. So that's glutamate dehydrogenase. So yeah, I think that's a really good screening test. Um, so what I would do is if I had a person that I had a suspicion that they had that, I would send off one of two tests. I think the GDH test is a good one to send off. And then I also send off another one. So I actually do two tests as a screening test. This is just my preference. I send off a GDH antigen, which is a good sensitivity but poor specificity. Then I send off what's called a PCR test also known as like a nucleic acid amplification test. And I'm looking for the toxins, toxins A and B from the C. diff bacteria, okay? So I send both of those off. Those are kind of like my screening test. I like the GDH, it's kind of like the sensitive, non-specific, the PCR or nucleic acid amplification test, testing for toxins A and B is more specific, okay? It's a little bit more specific in picking up on like toxigenic strains of C. diff, okay? If those come back positive for the GDH antigen and the PCR test or the nucleic acid amplification test picks up some of the C. diff toxins, I have a very high like potential like uh, predictive value of them having C. diff. So then I send one more test and I'll send off an enzyme immunoassay for toxins A and B. And that'll pick up specifically which toxin. Okay, so those are the things that I go with as the particular stool analysis testing for C. diff. I'll send off a GDH and a PCR, okay, particularly looking for GDH antigen. It's an enzyme immunoassay, which will pick up that glutamate dehydrogenase enzyme. And then I'll send off a PCR or nucleic acid amplification test for the toxins. If those come back positive, one, you can do one or the other, you can do both. If those come back positive, I send an enzyme immunoassay for toxin A and B of C. diff. If those come back positive, I have a very high likelihood of them having C. diff. Okay? So that's kind of like how I go about this. So here's kind of the quick rundown on that. I start off with my GDH assay. Good screen. Not super specific. It's kind of like sensitive. Decent sensitivity. Then I send off the C. diff a and B toxin PCR, high specificity, reveals some toxigenic strains. And then I get that EIA, the enzyme immunoassay of the toxin A and toxin B. And this is gonna pick up specifically if it's A or B C. diff toxin. So I kinda go like off of this. If the GDH or the PCR is positive, send the enzyme immunoassay which identifies A or B toxin. So you can do either one of these, the PCR or nucleic acid amplification test or the enzyme aminoassay of the GDH. If either one of these come back positive, send off the enzyme aminoassay for toxin A or toxin B. Okay? Okay, so we've done the stool analysis. After I've done the stool, so someone asked a question, da, 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 but the question is, do you empirically treat? I would not empirically treat just yet, okay? We should be good stewards of antibiotics, right? We should try to avoid antibiotic administration if it's not absolutely necessary. I say this person has a high likelihood, but I shouldn't start empirically treating them just yet. I would hold off particularly on empirically treating this patient. Well, actually, let's let's actually, let me, let me come back here for a second. If the person is hypotensive, which they are, they're tachycardic, they have a significant leukocytosis with a left shift, they have a lactic acidosis. I don't have an obvious source of infection, but I have a high suspicion that they have some C. diff. Okay, yes. I guess if I'm thinking about it now, yeah, that wouldn't be a bad idea to empirically treat them um, with maybe some broad spectrum antibiotics and then narrow it down once I found out, oh, it's definitely C. diff, I can probably click off some of those particular antibiotics. Because if I'm just going with broad spectrum, I'm probably going to start off with like, oh, let me hit my MRSA, my gram positive with VANC. Let me hit all my gram negative and pseudomonas infections with uh, Zosin or Cefepime. Let me hit all my kind of anaerobic infections with metronidazole. And so you'll have them on a 
large broad spectrum and then the thing is is I would kind of pull that back once I've definitely diagnosed that it's C. diff so yeah I guess in a way you can empirically treat them but just be careful because some of those antibiotics especially you know some of them particularly if you put them on like a third generation a carbapenem or anything like that then it could potentially worsen um, their underlying infection so I would say yes it's not a bad idea to start broad spectrum especially with this person's clinical context just make sure you take their clinical context into, into the you know into the scenario of okay do i really need broad spectrum antibiotics in this patient i say this patient definitely could fit that bill it's hypotensive tachycardic they got a crazy high white count they got potentially a source of infection or diarrhea so i think they could fit the bill of potential sepsis so i could start them on broad spectrum narrow it once i figured out where the exact source is yes so i, I do think that that is an okay decision okay um who was asked that question they said Eric, Eric asked that. So yeah, I do think that actually I would probably start them off on some broad spectrum. Okay, let's see, let's see, let's see. So someone asked what the C. diff stands for. Uh, Clostridium difficile. Okay, oh, someone already put that down. Triple A, triple A. Nice. Okay, um, so we got the stool analysis done. The next thing we could do is, someone said similar manifestations of pheochromocytoma, but that's probably far-fetched. <laughs> I mean, you can always, it's always good to have uh, these crazy, um, what do you call them, zebras in your mind. Pheochromocytoma causes more hypertension. Um, it would cause hyperglycemia. It would cause tachycardia. Um, usually, it kind of puts them into this intense, anxious state. And they're usually resistant to any kind of, like, medications, especially, like, beta blockers and alpha blockers. So, uh, but, no, it, it, you think it could be feel i mean it's, it's always something don't ever rule out those zebras sometimes they come in you know every now and then um i've picked up one or two zebras you know and it's it's, it's sometimes it's good to have those things in the back of your mind uh they're not always going to be there they're super rare sometimes uh, the only kind of condition i've ever picked up on was uh hlh uh and it was just a random thought and it ended up being correct but you know don't ever rule out those potential zebras. Just make sure that it actually goes along with the clinical context and you don't put the patient through unnecessary testing. All right, anyway, we have this stool analysis. We definitely have a high likelihood. Let's say that this person did have a positive GDH. Let's say that their PCR was positive. Let's say that their enzyme amino assay identified a toxin. I'm going to get some imaging, right? Imaging is helpful. Um, it definitely is helpful to determine if they have fulminant colitis. Um, I definitely think it's a good idea, especially for complications. So let's say that I got an abdominal x-ray on this patient. I got the abdominal x-ray and it looks like this. Oh my gosh. Look at this. Look at this. Well, someone please look at this. Dang, big old bowel. So this dude has got a large, large bowel. You can see the hostra. Look at that. You see all the hostrations? That's pretty cool, right? So you, see, you can see all the hostrations there. And if you were to measure this actual bowel, usually you want it to be less than six centimeters, but this son of a gun is a little bit greater than six centimeters. So greater than six centimeters is definitely indicative of kind of like a dilated bowel. And in this case, I would be very, very concerned for like almost uh, some type of potential for like a colitis, like a pseudomembranous colitis, or maybe even on the verge of like a toxic megacolon. Okay. So definitely like a very large kind of bowel appearance here that you can see some dilation of the bowel loops. And then if we go back here, so definitely concerned for some colitis, definitely concerned for some problematic issues in that large bowel. You can get a CT of the abdomen as well. And I think a CT of the abdomen, it's okay. Again, it's good for looking at complications. If I were to look at their large bowel here, look at this son of a gun. There's thickening of the wall. There's peri bowel stranding. So there's a lot of fat stranding around the bowel. And then you see all of this kind of like pseudomembrane that's all around here. So that could be a pseudomembranous colitis. Okay, so pseudomembranous colitis. So definitely that's something that you want to see. Now, here's the big thing to think about. Usually in C. diff, it's pancolitis. Okay, it's a pancolitis. Usually it's pancolitis. You're going to get kind of inflammation of a continuous segment of their large bowel okay that's an important thing whereas in com comparison with something like Crohn's disease you may get an inflammation normal bowel inflammation normal bowel 
And that can be difficult because in ulcerative colitis, you get a pancolitis. So sometimes that can be somewhat difficult. Um, but in looking for any kind of pancolitis, thick bowel walls, any signs of perf, any signs of like uh, fat stranding nearby, that could be somewhat helpful in determining if there is any kind of uh, C. diff colitis. Okay. Again, you can get an abdominal x-ray. It's a really good thing to especially look for any kind of concerns of like a colitis, toxic megacolon, CT of the abdomen is really good for looking at any kind of perfs, pneumoperitoneums, um, any signs of megacolon, thick bowel walls. Now colonoscopy, I would probably try to stay away from those, especially in a critically ill individual. You have a higher risk of perforation. You may be able to see those classic findings of a pseudomembranous type of colitis, but I would probably stay away from a colonoscopy. Um, so, sorry, um, Prothvi, AXR is abdominal x-ray. I apologize. Okay. So, yeah, I would probably stay away from a colonoscopy. So, I would send off those tests. I would get an abdominal x-ray first. See what it looks like. If I see any kind of like dilated bowel loops, any signs of ileus, any signs of colitis, any signs of potentially a toxic megacolon, I'd send them for a CT abdomen to rule out any kind of complications. Specifically, do I see any perf? Do I see any near peritoneum? Do I see any signs of like a megacolon as well? That's kind of where I would draw the line, okay? So again, we've already looked at their images. We definitely see that they have some signs of colitis here. We see some pseudomembranous colitis there of the bowel wall. So with them having a positive C. diff testing, a significant leukocytosis, a lactic acidosis, a pre-renal AKI, they have diarrhea, they have hypotension, tachycardia, they have signs of, of colitis, they have signs of potentially on the verge of toxic megacolon, if that is the case, I should definitely be worried about a fulminant type of colitis or a fulminant type of C. diff. So if, with a fulminant C. diff, those are a lot more severe, okay? So here's my question for you guys. We definitely have a person with fulminant clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. Pretty severe case. I'm going to treat them by each individual problem. So cardiac, they're hypotensive, they're tachycardic. Love you, Mr. Doctor. <laughs> All right. um, they're hypotensive, they're tachycardic. What are my treatments? What's my goal? And what are my parameters to see if I've success successfully resuscitated them? Next thing, renal, they have an AKI. What's my treatment for that? What's my goal, parameters? And then again, so someone said self-healing push. Why would you avoid a colonoscopy? So if they, let's say that they did have severe colitis, they did have um, a, a toxic megacolon. If I stick that colonoscopy uh, tubing up there, I have a higher risk of perforation. Also, if I go up and I do a colonoscopy, it might not make any difference in their overall management. Okay, so that's another reason why. It may not make a very big difference in how I manage the patient if they get the colonoscopy, because it may tell me that they have a pseudomembranous type of colitis, but other diseases have pseudomembranous colitis. And they have a high risk of perforation associated with the procedure. Just stay away from it. It's not very helpful. Okay, so AKI, what are my treatments? Lactic acidosis, what are my treatments? How do I know if I'm treating them successfully? GI, what's, they have diarrhea. What's my treatment for that? And then lastly is how do I treat the actual C. diff? All right, so you guys are starting off with the first one for cardiac hypotension tachycardia. Okay, I give them fluids. Good. My question for you is which kind of fluids? Do I give normal saline or do I give lactate to ringers? Which one do you guys like? Normal saline, LR. Okay, so guys are saying volume for a map greater than 85. Um, beta blockers, IV fluids. So some say normal saline. Okay. So I am a big fan of, I probably already said this before, I'm a, I'm a big fan of lactated ringers. Um, I think lactated ringers is way more... Um, just a superior IV fluid. Um, the question that would probably come up and people would be concerned is, oh, they have a lactic acidosis. Wouldn't you giving them lactate worsen their lactic acidosis? No. It actually, there's been certain like articles that actually show 
that the lactate that comes from the, the, LL, the LR, really there is no problematic issue. Lactic acidosis is not a contraindication and there's no issues with giving them LR. The other thing is that they're acidotic. People say, oh, well, lactated ringers, that would cause more acidosis, wouldn't it? No, actually LR has less of a cause, like less risk of acidosis. It's actually less likely to cause acidosis in compared to normal saline, okay? Um, and I just think it's a better fluid. If you give tons and tons and tons and tons of chloride to a patient in the form of sodium chloride and normal saline, that high chloride pushes that, uh, what happens is it causes the afferent arterioles to just clamp down, squeeze down, and it reduces the flow to the glomerulus. So I would stick with LR. So I would bolus them with a liter of uh, LR. And what I'm watching for is I'm looking for a blood pressure target. Obviously, if I'm giving them fluid, I'm giving it for their pressure and for their sinus tachycardia. So I would do that now. I, generally, MAP goals differ. It differs, really, depending upon the issue. This patient's more on the septic side, so I would aim for a MAP greater than 65. Um, you can aim for higher goals. It just depends on why you're aiming for that higher goal. Are you aiming for a higher goal to perfuse the brain because they have an underlying stroke or what's the reason? You know, so I, or you're, they have a problem with their, their spinal cord and you're perfusing the blood pressure. You're increasing their MAP goal to perfuse the spinal cord. It depends. Uh, MAP greater than 65 is the classic kind of pressure goal that you go with. So I would give them fluids and I would see if they can get them to a MAP greater than 65. The problem is, is I wouldn't put, I wouldn't keep hitting them and hitting them and hitting them with tons and tons and tons of fluid. Um, I would probably give them a liter, maybe two liters over a couple hours. And I would start off with a liter over an hour. I would see what that does with their blood pressure. And then if it, if their blood pressure picks up, if their urine output increases, that's a good sign. And I maybe give them another bolus and see what that does with them. But I wouldn't keep hitting them and hitting them and hitting them with fluid because again, you can put them into this fluid overload state. So if I'm giving them tons of fluid boluses, and they're still not meet, meeting that pressure goal, I might throw them on a vasopressor, something like phenylephrine, something like norepinephrine, and put them on that to see if that can help to pick up their blood pressure, okay? So that's what I would do, and if I'm meeting a MAP greater than 65, the urine output's improving, their creatinine's going down, um, and they're able to maintain that MAP greater than 65, they have an improvement in their tachycardia, I think those are all good parameters, okay? Renal-wise, AKI, same thing. We said we suspected that it was probably um, likely what? It was probably pre-renal, right? So we give them fluids. We give them IV fluids. Maybe we give them one, two liters of LR. See how they do with that. Does their urine output increase? What are we aiming for for urine output? Greater than point five cc's per kg per hour. If they're at least putting out more urine, I like to go with okay. If I gave them some fluid boluses, did their urine output at least increased by, and did they at least have 200 cc's of urine within at least the first two hours of that fluid bolus? That's kind of how I like to look at it. If they did, okay, there was some benefit to that fluid. And their urine output's improving, their kidneys are working, okay? So I look at their urine output, I look to see if it's improving, it's increasing with fluid boluses. If it's not improving with fluid boluses, please, for the love of goodness, don't keep giving them fluid, 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 fluid. It might not be the answer. Maybe a simple thing is, because when you're giving fluid, you're augmenting blood pressure. Maybe the thing to do is increase their blood pressure a little bit. So don't give them fluid, put them on a vasopressor. The vasopressor is gonna fix their hypotension. And so if you put them on a vasopressor, that'll increase their blood pressure enough to perfuse those kidneys and help them to make urine better, okay? And again, I'm looking for an increase in urine output, maybe a drop in their creatinine as well. Lactic acidosis, the problem is likely fluid, but it's also potentially bowel destruction or necrosis of the bowel. So if they have some bowel wall necrosis or destruction, or it's also hypovolemia from sepsis, fluid resuscitation is gonna be good, but also if there's tissue destruction that may have to result in a colectomy or treatment of the underlying cause, which is this infection. So you may try fluid, IV fluids, and then help to trend their lactates maybe every couple hours, six hours, and see if the lactate's going down. Don't try to blast them with fluid though um, and expect that their lactate's gonna automatically, you know, automatically just continue to tank. You know, LR, I mean, uh, lactate should not be a parameter by which you fluid resuscitate somebody. Um, you should just trend their lactates to see if it's going down because it can kind of tell you that they're the badness 
right? Their level of hypovolemia, sepsis, bowel destruction. Maybe that's going down as your fluid resuscitating them or they're improving. But don't always use it as a uh, fluid resuscitation target. So I give them some fluids, see how they respond, okay? Next thing, diarrhea. Okay, this is where I love to ask, what do we do for the diarrhea? What do I do for the diarrhea for this patient? So they're just peeing out their butthole. What can I do to reduce this diarrhea? Should I do anything for the diarrhea? So what do I do? What do I do, guys, for the diarrhea? Come on, engineers. Don't be looking it up on the phone. <laughs> Don't Google it. What do I do? Awesome. Some of you guys are hitting the nail right on the head. Nothing. I do not give them any kind of anti-diarrheal agent. If I give them an anti-diarrheal agent, it could make it worse. <laughs> Because I'm, that's kind of the benefit in a way the body's kind of own, it's so cool, right? To see how the body kind of comes up with a way of dealing with this. So in a way, the body is trying to rid the pathogen by causing di the diarrhea, right? So the diarrhea is what's allowing for that pathogen to be kind of eliminated from the body. So don't put them on anti-diarrheal agents. You'll just allow for that pathogen to kind of stay within the bowels. Allow for them to have that diarrhea. Just fluid resuscitate them based upon those sensible losses that is coming from the diarrhea. Maybe you have to just resuscitate them with fluids or if they're losing lots of like glucose from their actual bowel um, or they're having some issues maintaining a proper nutrition, again, you can give them the fluids back and maybe a little bit of nutrition, whether that be through um, giving them a little bit of glucose or maybe you have to start some type of nutrition if you can. Uh, sometimes, if, if it's possible, giving nutrition via, via like a, an NG tube sometimes is an option. But again, it depends. If they have like a toxic megacolon, a severe ileus or something like that, uh, I probably would stay away from that and make them MPO. But I would stay away from any kind of antidiarrheal agents, allow for them to just kind of eliminate that pathogen on their own and just give them fluids to resuscitate the volume that they're losing from those sensible losses and the nutrition as needed. Okay? Yeah, you just want to get it all out. <laughs> That's great. All right, good. Good, 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 good. All right, glad we're on the same page with that. The next thing is for the C. diff bacteria itself. What is the treatment? What's the first line treatment for the C. diff bacteria, what do I give to treat the actual bacteria? Okay. Well, obviously we want to get rid of the offending agent. So get the clinda out of there. Get that son of a gun out of here. We don't want that thing no more. But what are we going to put them on to be able to rid that bacteria? Okay. So Dr. MKK said Vanco, oral Vanco, good. Um, oral Vanco and Safe said, I love it. Saif said, Vancomycin PO slash IV metronidazole. Some said metronidazole, some said Vanco. Some said Vanco orally plus metronidazole IV plus surgery for Anca. Yeah, outstanding. You guys are smart cookies, man. So I would say here's here's how, I, okay, here's the next question. Okay, let's say that we pick Vanco. Vanco is, Vanco used to be the number one. We're actually saying that metronidazole actually may be the number one. Um, and the reason why metronidazole IV may be a little bit more superior to vancomycin is that it penetrates the bowel wall in comparison to vancomycin, which is not as good at penetrating the bowel wall. Um, so that, be, that could be one reason, that the vancomycin is not as great at being able to penetrate into the bowel wall where the C. diff is actually causing all these problems in comparison to the IV vancomycin, which does penetrate the bowel wall. But let's say that a person has a non-fulminant type of uh, C. diff colitis, right? So they have C. diff, it's non-fulminant. They don't have the toxic megacolon. They don't have the colitis. They don't have the ileus. They just have the diarrheas, right? In that kind of situation, what would you treat them with? 250 of vancomycin Q6 or 500 of vancomycin Q6? It's obvious. I'm obviously giving the super super easy answer. It's the 250, right? If it's fulminant, if they have toxic megacolon, if they have ileus, if they have any kind of hemodynamic state that is unstable, you treat them with 500 Q6. 
for 10 to 14 days. Okay, so vancomycin, 250 for the non-fulminate, and then 500 for the fulminate, Q6 hours, and again, you're doing that about 10 to 14 days, longer if need be. Okay, IV metronidazole is actually shown to be superior though. Okay, so we can do IV metronidazole, 500, Q6 to eight hours, and again, you're doing it for about 10 to 14 days. And again, the superiority of it is that it may be able to penetrate the bowel wall, which is a little bit better. Someone already hit the nail on the head, though, with the Vanco, is that you got to be careful. They already got a kidney injury. You give them that Vanco, you better be measuring those trough levels and making sure that the Vanco isn't super therapeutic, because if it is, it can cause an intrarenal AKI. Worsening their kidney injury and fluids is not going to fix an intrarenal AKI, then you're going to have to end up treating this with potentially like dialysis if they end up getting so bad that, you know, their kidneys aren't making any kind of urine. So good, good point. Um, Sylvia said that. So watch out for that IV Vanco, making sure, well, it's actually PO Vanco. PO Vanco, make sure you guys remember that. It's not IV Vanco, PO Vanco is my sin, is the only one that you really give for um, C. diff because it has to go through the bowel wall to be able to work on that bacteria within the gut. Okay. IV metronidazole just is good because it has the ability to penetrate the bowel wall um, via the uh, systemic circulation. So, again, nonetheless, make sure that you're monitoring those trough uh, levels with Vanco. Okay, cool. So we've got the antibiotics to treat that. Oh, you guys are talking about how it stinks. Yeah, C. diff be, be nasty. I've only smelt it once and it was enough to, you know, um, almost, you know, make me pass out. Uh, yeah, C. diff is pretty rough, and the GI bleed is pretty rough too, Margaret. Yeah, uh, it's pretty pretty nasty stuff. Yeah, you don't want to have to smell those things. <laughs> but yeah, uh, C. diff, those are the treatments that you give. Vanco, oral, or metronidazole IV. Okay, cool. The next thing that we would do is, what else? Okay, we started off with all this stuff right there, right? We gave them IV fluids, normal saline, lactated ringers. If we're giving lots of fluids, give them the, the vasopressors. Target a map greater than 65, look to see that their map is improving with fluids. And if it's not, maybe add on a presser, make sure their heart rate's kind of improving, lactate's kind of going down, BU and creatinine's going down, urine output's going up. For that AKI, give them some IV fluids. If that's not improving and you're giving them a ton of fluids and it's not changing anything, pressers. Aim for an increase in urine output, drop in the creatinine. Reverse that cause, lactic acidosis. If it's hyperperfusion, it's IV fluids and pressers. If it's the tissue destruction, we got to treat the C. diff, antibiotics versus a colectomy. And then you might want to check the lactate to see if it's going down little bit by little bit by little bit. Okay? So Margaret Rainey said, once you work in the ICU, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I do, but we don't see C. diff too often, to be honest with you. Um, I've only seen C. diff once on my ICU. We, we try to be pretty good stewards of antibiotics, obviously. Uh, the other thing with me working on the ICU is that most of the patients I have in my ICU are neuro patients and they have fevers because of their underlying neurological issue. They have leukocytosis due to their underlying kind of stress state and uh, kind of reactive from potentially the surgeries or the event that they had. So sometimes it's really, really difficult to hash out. Is this infection um, or is it a neurogenic cause of uh, fever and leukocytosis? And so sometimes we have to be very, very careful prescribing antibiotics because it could be their underlying neurological issue, not an infection. So that kind of reduces us from really trying to prescribe antibiotics empirically. We really try to stay away from that unless there's absolute definite source of uh, potential sepsis. But anyway, we, uh, we treat the lactic acidosis, we treat the diarrhea. Remember we said no anti-diarrheal agents, just allow for them to squirt that stuff out, all right? And then just replace that with fluids and nutrition. We already talked about the Vanco, right? We talked about the metronidazole. And here's the big, 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 big thing. Do not recheck those stool tests to see if you giving them antibiotics improved. That's not gonna change. That stool test may still be positive. Okay, so do not check the stool tests, okay? The last thing is if you've done the antibiotics, you've tried it, they're refractory to it, they're not responding to it, they have a toxic megacolon, they have a perf, they have terrible pseudomembranous colitis, 
or their lactate. They actually say that there was an article recent lactate of greater than five, and sometimes if it's even approaching five, and their white count being super high, greater than 25, it may be an indication, especially if you definitely see that they have C diff, you've diagnosed C diff, lactate greater than five, white blood cell greater than 25, that also says that there may be an indication for a colectomy, cutting out the disease segment of the actual bowel wall that's been infected by the C diff, okay? So colectomy is really for the fulminant cases of toxic megacolon, a perf, refractory to medical therapy, or diagnosis of C. diff with a lactate greater than five and a white blood cell count greater than 25, okay? Okay. I just wanna leave off, there's alternative treatments that are coming out that have been somewhat effective, um, but they, we still need a lot of literature um, and uh, data to really support behind this, but there's some that are actually coming out there called tegacycline, it's an uh, antibiotic, and it's potentially been shown to inhibit some of the toxin secretion from uh, the C. diff, and so sometimes this may be used in certain types of refractory cases to, um, uh, in response to vancomycin or ivimetronidazole, you can add on the tegacycline sometimes, um, but there's a couple case series reports on this. The other one is there's what's called a uh, monoclonal antibody, um, bezlotoximab. It's actually a, somewhat of a prophylactic for patients with recurrent C. diff. And then the last one here is what's called the fecal microbiota transplant. You actually give them a fecal transplant. Um, and this one, don't do this inpatient. Never do this one inpatient. Um, it's primarily for outpatient uh, prophylaxis of recurrent C. diff as well. Okay, so these are some of the things that are also alternative options and treatments for patients with C. diff. Okay. So that covers our case study on C. diff. I hope this helped, I hope it made sense. I hope it gives you guys an approach of how to really um, think about C. diff, think about, so the big things that I want you guys to take away from this is antibiotics, which ones are the big ones? Three plus stools a day, that's a big thing. Watery diarrhea, um, if, especially if they have any past medical history of chronic kidney disease, liver disease, IBD, those are things that put them at high risk. Um, any kind of signs of an intense leukocytosis, any signs of a volume downstate, uh, particularly like kind of identifying like a pre-renal AKI. Um, also looking for those stool tests. Remember the GDH, the PCR, the nucleic acid amplification test are two good uh, screenings. Follow up with the enzyme amino assay to find the specific type of toxin. Abdominal x-ray is a good screening test to look for any kind of ileus, colitis. CT scan to look for complications associated with the C. diff. Don't do a colonoscopy. If you're treating, treat each individual issue, but specifically the C. diff, it's vancomycin PO, 250 for non-fulminant, 500 for the fulminant, Q6, for 12, 10 to 14 days, IV vancomycin, good or better at penetrating the bowel wall, 500, Q6 to eight for 10 to 14 days. Colectomy, if they have toxic megacolon, fulminant colitis, or they're refractory to medical therapy, or they have di diagnosed C. diff with a white cell count greater than 25, lactate greater than five. Okay, and then obviously there's an alternative treatments that you can try to these patients as well. But um, engineers, I hope this made sense. If you guys have any questions, I'll hang around for like a couple minutes and then we can talk. We can uh, do anything that you guys want to go over real quick about this topic and then hopefully meet up. Um, we will be not doing a case study next week and we'll actually kind of be, pretty much be going on a little bit of a break on the case studies uh, with the Christmas break time coming around. Um, definitely want to give some time for the ninja nerds to chill as well as you guys to relax. You guys are definitely doing hard work out there, whether it be, you know, um, working in school, whether it be in the hospital, whatever it is, you want to take some time to, to relax and, uh, you know, and enjoy that Christmas time with uh, family. So any other questions, let me know. Um, we'll probably come back uh, in the beginning of the year with some case studies. And we're also looking to maybe transition into what's called a, into a podcast. Uh, maybe doing some specific stuff that's actually kind of looking more at the clinical side of things in a podcast setting. But uh, any other questions that you guys have, hit me up. So Manor Rathor said, when do we consider dialysis in AKI? So we talked about this last time. It was um, I like to do the furosemide stress test. It tells me if they have an intrarenal AKI. So what I would do is I give them about one milligram per kilogram of body weight of Lasix. If they don't make more than 200 cc's of uh, urine within at least the first like two hours, I have an idea that their kidney is not working and they may have an intrarenal AKI and then giving them fluids, giving them pressors, giving them Lasix is not gonna help them. 
Um, and so if it is an acute kidney injury and I'm not able to control that and they continue to have a rise in their creatinine, a rise in their BUN, a significant drop in their urine output, despite all the medical therapies, then they may need, uh, they become completely anuric. Um, then I would say that that's an indication for maybe some dialysis, maybe CRRT, maybe intermittent hemodialysis, something of that nature. So Ryan Julio said, can the patient eat? Um, if they can, if they don't have like a really, really bad kind of colitis, toxic megacolon, that let them eat. You know, there's not no problem with letting them eat if they actually have the, the um, the ability to eat. Okay. It's definitely, definitely, definitely a good idea to have them to try to get that nutrition. Cause obviously you want to try to avoid any kind of TPN or anything like that. So yeah, there's, there's, um, I think there was a, I forget which, which study it was, but yeah, that I think there, when I was reading through the literature on this particular case study, they were saying that, yeah, trying to have them eat if they can is definitely a good idea. Probably try to stay away from them. If there's any concern for toxic megacolon, or some type of fulminant colitis, then I'd probably not try to feed them. <laughs> Ooh, podcast, yeah. Yeah, it'd be really cool. We're really kind of, a, what we're trying to do with the podcast is hopefully, we'll see, we were gonna ask you guys what, we were either gonna do one of two things. We were gonna make it really, really clinical to help you guys who are going out into like maybe residency, internship, going out or working in the field. Maybe to have like particular diseases where we focus on it. We give you guys a very classic like step-by-step -step approach on how to approach this disease, how to diagnose it, how to treat it properly, all based on evidence-based medicine. And so we'd have all the articles and stuff like that that we would go off of. Or the other option is um, doing topics that are very short that are based upon USMLE Step 1, USMLE Step 2 kind of topics. Um, and so you guys can kind of maybe throw some comments down there and tell me what you guys think about that. Uh, but yeah, hopefully we're gonna try to tackle podcasts um, and maybe we'll scale back a little bit on the um, uh, the case studies maybe like once a month. But we'll we'll, we'll figure it out more uh, in, the, in the coming year. All right. All right, engineers. Well, thanks again. Um, I hope um, that this made sense. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Um, and hopefully we can, well, actually enjoy your Christmas break, Ninja Nerds. You guys have earned it. You guys are definitely out there working hard and doing the best that you guys can. So Ninja Nerds, I love you. I thank you. Thank you for being so awesome. Enjoy your Christmas time with family and friends. And as always, Ninja Nerds, until next time.